I suppose most of you are familiar with this old optical illusion. And you're asked the question, which of the three thick black lines is the longer? And I suppose one's natural reaction is to say, the one on the left. And I think you know that this is a result of the illusion of perspective. But this is an example of Maya, that word from Indian philosophy which generally has the meaning of illusion, or rather, illusions brought about by the acceptance of certain conventions of which perspective was an example. Now I think one of the conventions by which we tend to be fooled more than almost any other is time. And for all human beings, time is a matter of extraordinary importance. And perhaps this is one of the principal ways in which we differ from animals. Because man has been called a time-binding animal. That is to say, a creature who is vividly aware of the fact that his life moves, as it were, along a line from the past through the present and into the future. Animals apparently live pretty much moment by moment. They don't appear to have very strong memories, but because man has a strong memory, he is able to bear the past in mind and as it were, cast it forward into visions of the future based upon what has happened in the past. And therefore, although this facility gives man the most extraordinary ability to plan his life, to prepare for future eventualities. At the same time, there is a very heavy price which he pays for it, and especially if he takes this ability too seriously. In other words, if he doesn't realize that the true reality in which he lives is the present moment now. We actually spend most of our time and a great deal of our emotional energy living in time which is not here living in an elsewhere which is not concretely real. So much so that although we may be quite comfortable and happy in our present circumstances, if there is not a guarantee, not a promise, of a good time coming tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, we are at once unhappy, even in the midst of pleasure and affluence. And so we develop a kind of chronic anxiety about time. We want to be sure more and more because of our sensitivity to the feeling of time. We want to be sure more and more that our future is assured. And for this reason, the future becomes of more importance to most human beings than the present. And in this sense, we are hooked, taken in, by a Maya, because it is of very little use to us to be able to control and plan the future unless we are capable at the same time of living totally in the present. My goodness, don't you remember when you went first to school? You went to kindergarten. And in kindergarten, the idea was to push along so that you could get into first grade and then push along so that you could get into second grade, third grade, and so on, going up and up. And then you went to high school and this was a great transition in life. And now the pressure is being put on. You must get ahead. You must go up the grades and finally be good enough to get to college. And then when you get to college, you're still going step by step, step by step, up to the great moment in which you're ready to go out into the world. And then when you get out into this famous world, comes the struggle for success in profession or business. And again, there seems to be a ladder before you, something for which you're reaching all the time. And then, suddenly, when you're about 40 or 45 years old in the middle of life, you wake up one day and say, Huh? I've arrived. And by Jove, I feel pretty much the same as I've always felt. In fact, I'm not so sure that I don't feel a little bit cheated. Because you see, you were fooled. You were always living for somewhere where you aren't. 
And while, as I said, it is of tremendous use for us to be able to look ahead in this way and to plan, there is no use planning for a future, which when you get to it and it becomes a present, you won't be there. You'll be living in some other future which hasn't yet arrived. And so in this way, one is never able actually to inherit and enjoy the fruits of one's action. You can't live at all unless you can live fully now. I mean, if the objective of music were to arrive at a point, say the last bar, the final great crashing chords of the symphony, well then all we'd do, we'd be just hurry up its playing, play it as fast as possible so as to get to the culmination, the end, as soon as possible. Or just cut out the whole symphony and play only the last bars. To be able to enjoy it, we have got to live each moment of the playing and listen to it as if it were the only thing important to listen to. And then if we do that, our time has an entirely different quality. It's represented in a Buddhist saying that spring does not become the summer. There is spring and then there is summer. Firewood does not turn into ashes. There is first firewood, then there are ashes. The two stages being, as it were, sufficient by themselves. And this is intended to give the idea of living in a fully concrete present into which you settle in. I mean, the present for most of us is, isn't it, just a hairline on a dial. And the hand goes by it flash, and there's nothing in it, one after another. But here there is an entirely different sense of the present, as something you can settle into. I remember once a very wise man who used to give lectures on philosophical matters of this kind. Before he started giving any lecture, would sit for a while looking at his audience very intently like this. And then quite suddenly he would say, Wake up! You're all fast asleep. And if you don't wake up, I won't give any lecture. And another Chinese sage pointed one day to some flowers while talking to a friend and said, most people look at these as if they were in a dream. And Buddha, one of the wisest of the sons of Asia, his real name was Gotama, but he was called Buddha because Buddha means the awakened one, the man who woke up. Now in what sense was he awake? He was awake in the sense that he was completely all here. After all, we say about a person who's nuts, he's not all here. He's not all there. But our whole culture, our whole civilization, in so far as it is involved with time and living only for a future, is nuts. It's not all here. We are not awake. We are not completely alive now. And consequently we are so hungry and so greedy because everything seems tasteless. We are living for an abstraction which has not yet come to be. And we don't know what really is. 